Welcome. Uh, I am so excited to uh, to be here tonight, and it's gonna. This is gonna freak me out because I haven't been out here before. Now, as I'm looking out in the audience, I'm seeing people that I know, uh, some dear, dear uh, old friends, and a number of uh, former friends that I, I don't want to be here. Thank you for coming. I, there there are a number of uh, of special guests in the audience. Uh, th this is kind of funny. Uh, I was uh, told my friend Martha Linder is here from Lakeland, Florida, and she told me that Colonel Sussingham is going to be there. And I thought, who the heck's Colonel Sussingham? And then uh, Mark Halperin uh, introduced me to him. Uh, he was a, uh, a test pilot for the F-16s, is that right? The, the chief test pilot for the F-16s. Defining the envelope, not like those other test pilots. <laughs> they hang way, way back. He actually was pushing the envelope of what it could do. So a real, a real test pilot, um, but he dropped the first smart bomb, the first JDAM, and I thought, that is so cool, and I wanted to call him out and embarrass him in front of the group. So please applaud this man if you get a chance. If, not now, if you get a chance later on, you can applaud him. And then also, um, you know, since I'm, I'm calling out uh, uh, people who have uh, done great things in the, uh, in the air, um, some of you remember, eight or ten months ago, a Southwest plane lost an engine, a person was killed, uh, and a heroic uh, woman landed that plane. Her name is Tammy Jo Schultz, and she's with us in the room. Where are you, Tammy Jo? Don't be embarrassed. Where did she go? Where is she? She's right here. She's right here. Look, she's all embarrassed. I love it. I love embarrassing people. They can't squirm away. They have to take the applause. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, and Tammy Jo was, was, the, was one of the first women fighter pilots ever, okay? She pushed a different kind of envelope, so you just, you just watch it there, pal. Uh, but it's incredible. Any, any other uh, uh, aeronautic uh, people in the room here? Anybody who's really done anything spectacular, you know, at above, say, 30,000 feet? I'm just curious. Anybody? I didn't, I didn't think so. Well, this brings me uh, to the subject of the evening. There are very few people... Um, uh, in, uh, in whose presence I am genuinely humbled uh, and awed. And uh, that, that's true. Um, I first encountered the fiction uh, of Mark Halperin lo these 35 years ago. I was an undergraduate at Yale, and uh, we had a writing course, and somebody handed out, you know, mimeographed or stapled short stories that we had to read. And the first one uh, was called the, the Schroeder Spitze. I thought it was Die Schroeder Spitze, but it's The Schroeder Spitze. And it's a story uh, unlike any I had ever read. It's the sort of thing that if you are a fiction writer or a writer as I am who values great writing and poetry and true literature, um, when you read uh, most of what Mark Halperin has read, you, you understand you're in the presence of a rare genius. Um, that's a simple fact. I don't uh, heap praise on people lightly because there are a lot of uh, wonderful writers of fiction, but there are very few that are genuinely great artistic talents and geniuses. And there are so many sentences in his writing and so many sentences in that short story alone that make you understand you're dealing with a maniac, uh, a person who does not think the way you do. And either he's crazy or he's a genius or he's a crazy genius. And I think that genius and uh, insanity are closely linked. Um, but I really mean that, uh, that when you read his stuff, you understand that uh, this is somebody who, um, uh, he's in the, in the highest rank uh, of, of, of writers uh, in our time. And uh, I want to give you some basics of, of who he is just so that uh, we can relieve the tension here. He was born in 1947, uh, but oddly enough is only 62 years old. Now, I don't know how the heck you do that. That's wild. That's wild. Well, I'll ask you about that. Now, whenever you, if you know anything about Mark Halpern, you read these bios and they all say the same thing. They say, Mark Halpern was raised on the Hudson and in the British West Indies, which is nothing if not at least pretentious. <laughs> Who are we kidding? 
It says, uh, after receiving degrees from Harvard College and Harvard's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, he did postgraduate work at the University of Oxford, comma, Princeton, comma, and Columbia. I like the Oxford comma, thank you. Uh, he has served in the British Merchant Navy, the Israeli Infantry, and the Israeli Air Force. Uh, now, his stories were published in The New Yorker for a long time, almost about 25 uh, years. And as I said earlier, they are widely recognized uh, as some of the best short stories ever written in the English language. Now, I hate to say that with him in the room because it's embarrassing, but I'm just telling you straight up, it's a fact. Uh, he's right up there with the best of the best. And if you've ever read, for example, a collection of Faulkner's short stories, he pretty much stinks at writing short stories and novels if you really want to take the time <laughs> to talk about it with me. Um, a lot of the people that have been lauded as the greats are not really that great. Uh, at least they're not consistently great. Um, maybe Updike and Cheever leap into my head as people who have written great uh, fiction in, in our time, and of course they're both gone. Uh, so uh, it, it's just important um, that I say those things. Um, it wasn't uh, until 1986 that I got to see uh, Mark Halperin in person. I was at Yaddo, which is a writer's colony uh, in um, Saratoga Springs, and somebody said, oh, Mark Halperin's speaking at uh, Albany someplace. So we went and heard Mark there, and he was like a stand-up comedian. It was sheer lunacy, which is why he's not giving a speech tonight. I'm going to interview him because we need to tamp it down. We need, we need to get somewhere in the conversation. But uh, extremely funny and a joy to listen to. Um, sometime in the early 90s, I was in Nantucket, and I was bored, and I walked into a bookstore. I picked up the Paris Review, which they've had those interviews stretching back to, you know, uh, Hemingway uh, in, in the 50s. And uh, it was an interview with Mark Halperin, whose fiction I had loved. And I started reading it. And what struck me about the interview, mostly, was that I had by that time swung politically conservative, I guess, and had become very serious about my Christian faith. And as I read uh, the interview with Mark Halperin, it stunned me uh, that uh, he seemed to take the concept of God seriously and seemed to be politically conservative. And if you know anything about uh, the world of uh, arts and letters in America at this point, you, you realize that those two things really never uh, go together, that, that the world of, uh, uh, of literature, if you hang out with writers, they tend to be rather monolithically, extremely uh, politically liberal. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but, th but if you're not of that ilk, it becomes uncomfortable. So I was kind of stunned, really, to read this about Mark Halpern, and I thought, how has he survived uh, in that world? Uh, and the answer is he's a hermit. He never talks to those people. But I was just impressed then, and so it, it, it renewed afresh my uh, interest in reading him, and I remember reading Winter's Tale and The Soldier of the Great War around that time. And these are, again, uh, these are works of fiction of the absolute highest order. Uh, he has routinely, he's cracked jokes about it, been compared to, you know, Tolstoy. Well, where do you go from there? Socrates in the city, obviously. Um, <laughs> So uh, it really is uh, a very, very great honor for me uh, to have lived long enough uh, to get to a point uh, where I get to, to talk uh, to Mark, just like he's a regular person. Believe me, he's not, but uh, as you'll soon see. But uh, it really is a great joy. And it's, so it's my honor uh, to welcome you, Mark Halpern, to Socrates in the City. Please join me on the stage. That was, uh, am I on? Yes. You're, that, you're on, sir. Yeah, that was uh, absolutely spectacular. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say that uh, how many people come up here and make a joke about Socrates drinking hemlock? How many uh, crack jokes about how, I actually... Uh, I'm you, not going to do that. Uh, but what I'm going to say many. is that um, Macaulay, you know who Macaulay was, the 19th century... The historian. English historian. He was the Chuck Schumer of his day. Uh, he, every word that came out of his mouth was a, was a lie. And <laughs> including, including, including if, a, and, and, ba, a and, and, ba, the. and, ba. Yeah. yeah. You know what ba means, right? If, and, and, ba. But uh, he said 
the more I read Socrates, and this is, uh, he didn't say it that way, but I'm sure that this you is... Know, nobody living can imitate Macaulay, but yeah. go ahead. But he said, the, the more I read Socrates, uh, the more I understand why he was poisoned. <laughs> and, uh, of course, no one ever read Socrates because we know him only through Plato. So Macaulay was just a, a, a terrible uh, fraud. Yeah. Right. And by the way, if there are any relatives of Chuck Schumer in the audience, yeah. get, yeah. get out. Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, uh, the, the point of Socrates in the City uh, is not merely to uh, interview interesting people. Um, it's typically uh, to dig deeper uh, about the big, the big questions. Now, I don't normally push that, but when I have someone like you, uh, who has written um, as well and as very, very thoughtfully as you've done over the course of your life, uh, it's very tempting to me to ask you the question, which is the question of all questions, which I've never asked at Socrates in the City, but I think I'll ask it now, and we can move on from here. Uh, but my first question to you is, um, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> Uh, are you serious? <laughs> uh, Unfortunately for you, very you, serious. You see this tie? Yes, uh, sir. This is, see how long it is? Yeah. Uh, I, I did an interview in Chicago, and I looked at, the, at the, the television recording of it, and it was even longer. I mean, look how long it is. And I just don't understand that. I'm not that short. But they, it comes way down. I have to stop but buying the, my ties. But your height and the length of the tie really aren't necessarily related. Well, I don't know, but I, I'm going to stop buying my ties at the giraffe tie shop. Uh huh. Uh, All right. But th what is the meaning of life? Are you? I I, I, I don't know. I know you don't know, <laughs> but it strikes me that uh, you've thought about it very, very much over the course of your life, and I'm wondering what you think it might be. All because right. your fiction is not devoid of these kinds of ruminations. Yeah. So I, I, don't think, I don't ask this of most people at Socrates and City, but you strike me as somebody whom I might ask that question. Okay. And, it's a, it's and very, by the way, I just did. It's a very challenging question, obviously. Sure. It's the kind that you see in the New Yorker cartoon with the guy and sitting on a mountaintop and people come with knapsacks and ice axes and they, they ask him what the meaning of life is and he usually cracks a joke. Right. Uh, but, uh, and I've never been asked that kind of question. I'm not surprised. Yeah. But uh, let, me, let me struggle. I, uh, let me start by saying that uh, I knew Ray Carver, uh, otherwise known to people as Raymond Carver, one of the founders of the Minimalists. And uh, I didn't like Ray Carver for various reasons. Uh, he's dead now. So I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but I didn't like what he did to his family. I was around when that happened in, in I, Iowa. I just Iowa. hated his writing. Yeah, I had his writing too, except that I chose one of his stories, which was actually a very beautiful story uh, for the best American short stories of 1988, because I was the first one to ask for them to be submitted to me blind, not even with the typeface of The New Yorker, et cetera so that there would be no back scratching and no uh, uh, favors. And I just read it. I didn't know who wrote it. Uh, and I, it was a beautiful story about Chekhov. And it was written with Ray knowing about his own death. So that was, anyway, one good thing that he wrote. But he was ill at, at the time? He mean? was ill at the time. He had cancer. Uh, but to paraphrase him, he said, uh, I would say, what we talk about when we talk about uh, uh, dying well is living well because you can't, you can't uh, do anything when you're dead. So what you have to do in order to die well is to live well. And one should be able to die well. I've thought about that ever since I was a, a small child because it will come faster than you can possibly imagine. Uh, when it does happen, you look back and it's as if life passed that fast. So given that there will be uh, eternity on that side and we have come from eternity on this side, uh, Winston Churchill said, it's like uh, coming up from the ocean onto a raft for a few moments and then going back uh, into the ocean. Uh, what you want to do, really, I, what I would like to do, is to live uh, so that you do justice to the short time you have and so that you are comfortable returning to that eternity. To do so, in, in my uh, opinion, 
uh, you have to have some knowledge of the eternity on either side. When I was a, a, an infant, I felt that I did. I felt that I had existed before, not in another life, but in another form somehow, in a, in, in a, in, in, in a bodiless uh, form of, let's say, just an independent soul, uh, the Dantean idea that you are, that you are uh, with God you, somehow. You had that sense as an infant? As an infant in the crib. I knew I you, came from some place. You remember I, that? Yes, I remember that. And I, and I loved that place. And I felt very comforted by it. The place from which you'd come, not the crib. Place from which I had come. Yeah, not the crib. I had a very uncomfortable crib. It had spikes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so here, listen to this. Um, when I was born at the beginning of the seventh month in 1947 and not expected to survive, the hospital told my parents, the kid's going to die. He's going to die. And my parents were, were so upset that they left for two weeks. I'm not kidding. Um, Wait a minute. Yeah, they did. Hold on. Yeah. You were in the hospital. Yep. And your parents left for two weeks. Yes. They went did to they... Long Island. They went to East Hampton. <laughs> but wh which hospital? Doctor's Hospital, which has since been torn down. They found out that I was born there and they tore it down. <laughs> it overlooks that, Gracie. Is, is used that to in Manhattan? It used to overlook Gracie Mansion, yeah. Okay, so y you were there. Yeah. For two weeks. And your parents and, left. And they left uh, because they, well, I was born by accident, uh, evidently. My, my godfather was Robert Kappa, the photographer. My mother uh, always said that I was his son. But I know that I'm not his son. I'm my father's son because uh, I look like my father and uh, I have many traits of my father. There's no question that I was my father's son. But she evidently was having an affair with him, and my parents were about to break up. It was a very sad story. And then she was in a taxi accident, which is one reason why I was born so prematurely. But anyway, I was not wanted. And they left. Uh, and then when I came home, I was sick for a year, really, really sick. I was born with spina bifida uh, and uh, also with no cilia on my bronchia. So that fans the phlegm up. So, so I, I, in my childhood, I had pneumonia 12 times. And many of the times, I was put in ice baths and everything. And they thought, had I been Catholic, they would have called a priest. They thought I was a goner. And I was very, very close to death. And it never bothered me. Because each time, I really, I told, uh, where's the father? There he is. Hi. Uh, uh, each time, I felt tremendous comfort uh, as if, uh, an angel had come down and, and protected me. And I was not disturbed by the idea of dying. And I came very, very close. And once when I was uh, on Mount Rainier, I climbed Mount Rainier, and on the way back, I was running across an ice field. And there was a, uh, it was all kind of flat. And I, and I was jumping over crevasses. And so I jumped over a crevasse onto what was just a piece of white it looked like solid ground, but it was a crust over a crevasse. And I fell in the crevasse, and I, I put out my head. I had uh, ski poles at that point. I put out the ski poles, and the, the, the snow uh, went up in the air, and I saw it uh, absorbing. It was, it was sparkling in the sunlight. And I felt the greatest kind of joy. So I've never been afraid of, uh, of dying, and I've always felt that when I do, I will be going back to the place that I feel that I knew when I was uh, an infant. OK, so what do you do with the time in between when you're conscious and you are uh, active and you can do what you can do? I think the best thing you can do uh, is, to, is to embody the virtues, the classical virtues. In other words, if you, ha if you are honorable, uh, if you have courage, uh, if you if you love, if you d treat people correctly, um, and you and you and you also seek God in in whatever way you can, whether it be in art, uh, uh, particularly in music, because in in my book uh, Paris in the Present Tense, which uh, is, is not here, but uh, I, I say Jules Jules Lacour, who is a maître at the Sorbonne, says to his students, "Look, I know." I'm paraphrasing. I can never remember what I wrote. He says, look, I know that in a university, this is really a very dangerous thing to say, and uh, you probably will disagree with me, et cetera. I don't, I don't care. 
but I, what, I'm, what I have to tell you is that music is the voice of God. So if you seek God while you are alive and you become, you give thought to what came before and what will come after and you behave correctly uh, and, and you are charitable and brave, et cetera, et cetera, then, then you are, uh, uh, th that's, that's the meaning as far as I can tell. But let me just add something here. I was in Massachusetts doing a, a, another event. And uh, as part of it, uh, I was explaining, it was purely literary. It was supposed to be purely literary. And as I don't like this time. As, as part of it, uh, I was explaining that, uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, uh, the, the, what I called my conditions precedent for then saying what the book, which is Paris in the Present Tense, was about. And one of them was uh, the uh, resurrection of virtue, uh, which is not popular because people mock virtue as if you're, if you talk about virtue, you're just a, a, an old-fashioned fuddy-duddy, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, that's absolute garbage, and we, we need it to survive both as a country and as individuals, et cetera. And I and I said, well, look, uh, you know, heroism these days has been devalued, along with so much else. And uh, courage, uh, hero, you're supposed to be a hero if you bring cupcakes to school. And I gave various levels of what I think heroism is. I said, first, it's doing something that is noble and just. Of course, you have to define noble too, but that, that as we carry on, that, that you'll sort of see. The second level in the, in the escalation, on the escalation ladder is something which is noble and just and contrary to your immediate interests. Uh, the third level is doing something noble and just and contrary to your immediate interests, which leads to your death. And you have a real hero. And I would ask the audience, uh, I always do, uh, that's not the top. What's the top? Anyone know? Because that's not the highest level of heroism. The highest level is doing something which is noble and just, contrary to your immediate interests, which leads to your own death, and nobody knows. Which is another interpretation of, the, of what you see on uh, the tombs of the unknown soldiers throughout the world, known but to God. That's what real heroism is. Now, I have to tell you that afterwards I was signing books, and a guy came up to me. This last night? This last night, yeah. Uh, and this was Massachusetts. Keep that in mind. He comes up to me and he says, do you think that the people who tried to, to kill Hitler were heroes? And I said, yes. And he said, would you think I was a hero if I tried to kill our Hitler? No. What does Angela Merkel have to do with any of this? <laughs> <laughs> it was Massachusetts, so I knew what he meant. And uh, uh, I, that, that's something which, uh, it, you know, if you think about it, uh, we have lost uh, Lincoln, uh, Garfield, uh, McKinley, uh, and Kennedy. And there have been attempts in modern times, just in modern times, on Roosevelt, uh, Truman, uh, Ford, and Reagan. And this is a serious uh, topic. And people do, who talk about that, I remember when Reagan was elected, I lived in New York at that time, in 1980, and I saw in all these buildings, kill Reagan, kill Reagan, there's graffiti all over the place. And then of course that nut who now lives in Virginia and walks around, uh, shot him. Um, Where do you go from there? Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, it's very tempting to do an impression of William F. Buckley sitting up here, sat like this, you know? Yeah, yes. Uh, well, <clears throat> tell me, Mark. Uh, the question. What, what is the the uh, the? <laughs> no, he he was. The question becomes. Mm, uh, <laughs> What I want to ask you is that you're, you're making a number of assumptions. You talk about God, you talk about morality. Mm. Um, your fiction, and the reason I've asked you this question is because your fiction is filled with uh, muscular virtue, morality. It's all there. Your heroes are real heroes. There's a sense of justice, injustice in most of what you write. It's very strong. Uh, so I guess first I really want to ask you, where, where does that come from? Because it's one thing to say, 
I believe we should be virtuous. I agree. But, but how do you come to that? Were you raised in a home where those things were stressed? Were you raised in a home where God was, was part of your upbringing? How did you come to think that way? I think two ways. Uh, one, my father was the most extraordinary man. He was uh, a, well, uh, it's a long story, but I'll try to compress it. Uh, he was a student at Columbia, uh, first in his class, and his father had a, uh, a food processing business. His father had the dairy part, and they combined with a cousin, and they had a meat processing too. So my father was sent to uh, North Africa to buy sheep innards for sausage casings. This was in the 20s. And I have a picture of him in Patiz going throughout North Africa. It's, uh, he bargained with the tribes. And he went through North Africa, up through the Levant, Turkey, into Soviet Central Asia. And bargaining with these nomads, and they would send caravans with sheep innards to ports, and then it would be shipped back to the United States. And it took a very long time. And when he got back, uh, he was debriefed by, the, by uh, army intelligence. And that started a relationship with intelligence uh, that he carried on for most of the rest of his life. Uh, his lawyer in business was Bill, Wild Bill Donovan, who founded the OSS and CIA. So my father went to uh, Camp X during the war and was trained at Camp X in Canada by the SAS. The, the, uh, his final exercise was to be dropped a, bl blindfolded as, as a plane took off in a, an SS uniform, dropped by parachute into the woods of Ontario. And they said, you have to be in New York within two weeks. And if you're caught, we don't know you. Two weeks later. You said in an SS uniform? Yep. This was during the war? During the war, yeah. 50% of the people at Camp X died during the war. They were, they, were, they were in cells. They couldn't talk to one another. They were taught all the weapons. My father had a photographic memory, so he would, he, his job would have been, and it was, he was set to do this, to be parachuted into Germany and be captured w near where Heydrich was, deliberately to be imprisoned, and then with his photographic memory to remember, the, the, you know, count the steps, know where the doors are, to read upside down and backwards the German uh, on people's desks and, and on bulletin boards, whatever, then to escape, then to recount that to get intelligence about Heydrich. But I think the Czechs beat us to it. But anyway. In killing Heydrich. Uh, yeah, in killing Heydrich. But uh, he, so he, he, two weeks later, he, he, came, he, with a shave and a haircut and a Savile Row suit, he walked into the place where he was supposed to after having eaten at the oyster bar. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how he did it, but he could also... Uh, smoke, even when he was very old, uh, he would be smoking a cigar and stand on the diving board and then jump into the pool, swim underwater the length of the pool, come out, and the cigar would be still lit. Because <laughs> he could turn it upside down, back, hold it in his mouth and his teeth, and do that. He, he was quite miraculous. But any, anyway, when, when I was little, uh, <laughs> The, he, I, there were a lot of bullies, of course. Boys are bullied. And now, I suppose, I would uh, you know, accuse people of bullying me and try to keep them off the Supreme Court. But, but uh, they did beat the crap out of me. And so my father said, well, I'll, I'll teach you how to defend yourself. And I said, but I can't because they're so much bigger. You know, that's what a bully is. They're really much, much bigger. They're three or four grades higher. And they, they, he said, no, no, no. Let me show you how to do it. And he did. And there were a bunch of bullies who would frequently bully me. And I just, I just uh, practically killed them. Uh, and that brought up in me the desire always to be able to fight. And that, in turn, made me not afraid of being bullied. So uh, for the rest of my life, I figured, why not do what I think is right, no matter what the, the consequences. And that has led me to all kinds of armed uh, roles <laughs> in various armies, uh, police forces, intelligence places, et cetera. Which Just to be clear, you're packing now. <laughs> they think I'm yeah. joking. No, no. no. I'm, 
No. I, Anybody I'm, less will take you out? Yeah. In a second. No, but uh, you you are. You take that seriously. I, I don't want I don't want to go there yet because th there's yeah. so many rabbit trails it, with you. Just just to make sure that you know, we're in the Princeton clause under federal privilege, and uh, legally, totally legally. Yeah, that that goes without saying. Yeah. Um, what are we going to do? Um, now, I was on Obama's uh, protection detail three times. I had to decide whether I would take a bullet for him, and I decided that I would, which is a lot different from the guy who came up to me in the, in the, uh, yes, last night and was talking about assassinating the president. I, I did not think, to put it mildly, that Obama was the kind of person that I would want to protect, but he was the president of the United States. It's the office, et cetera. Um, and by the way, in Massachusetts, that guy's considered a moderate. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's quite true. That's quite true. Yeah, and he, um, he's not kidding, really. I lived in Massachusetts for 10 years yeah. and it almost killed me. Well, um, you, you, you still haven't really given me uh, an understanding of how you come to the, or maybe you, you haven't thought so much about it because you know it's right. But when you talk about, I mean, anyone who has read your fiction, and I'm sure most of these people have, it's why they're here, there, there's a fierce moral quality to it. And I guess, so I want to ask you this kind of silly question. How do you know what's right is right? How do you know what's good is good? Uh, you mentioned God in certain ways in your fiction. You, you have these moments of transcendence. Um, was there any, I know that you're ethnically Jewish. Were you raised uh, with any faith uh, as a kid or was it mostly no, that kind of stuff? No, you were not. No, no, I was not. I came to it on, on my own. When? Uh, suppose, uh, well, I mean, I came to uh, a, a recognition and a, uh, an experience of the divine presence when I was, from the beginning. So from, be, from when you were an infant? From when I was an infant. And uh, I, I, then in terms of, I don't really practice Judaism. Uh, it's not, I don't see it as a, something Maybe you're that, so good you don't, you don't need to practice. Well. Oh, come in, on. In, um, in, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold it. Uh, in, in Judaism, uh, there is a uh, there, there are many branches. Of course, there's the conservative, the the uh, reform who are Democrats, and there are conservatives who are Democrats, <laughs> <laughs> and there are the Orthodox who are Republicans, and among the Orthodox, there are the Hasidim, and you know those guys with the black hats, the diamond merchants, etc. Their yeah. Tea Party. Their tea party, yeah. <laughs> they, they are the spine of, of Judaism. Uh, I uh, serve as a, uh, also I protect them in, uh, in the Chabad houses. I'm a consultant to them and I have done protection duty for them because of the massacres in, in India, etc. cetera. Uh, but I can't practice it. I'm just not, I don't feel comfortable with that. But I come from a Hasidic background. Uh, my my ancestors were Hasidic rabbis. And the, the division in, in between Hasidism and the other, other Jewish uh, denominations, if you call them that, is that in Hasidism, you have a direct connection to God. You have to study too. You see, that I don't do. I don't know Talmud, Torah, etc. I can read uh, the Bible in Hebrew, but not very well, certainly not fluently, not as I should, if I were a, a real Hasid. But the, the whole point of Hasidism is that there is a direct connection without the kind of formal remediation that, that intermediation, excuse me, intermediation that you get in, in, uh, in other forms of Judaism. But they study hard, but you don't need to study hard, actually. You, you can experience it right uh, at the well. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, what, what, what I followed. And, and um, uh, uh, what was the question? <laughs> yeah. Oh, what's right? Okay. Meaning of yeah. Life. yeah. What, what's uh, right? Well, I mean, it's just, in fact, it's just like religion. You you um, you have many ways of approaching it and, and judging it, and it and you of course we're all fallible, so you, you can't be too confident in what is right, because you you may be wrong. We've all been wrong, and sometimes seriously. God knows I have. But you you make it a combination of uh, logic and reason and experience uh, and drawing upon others, considering other opinions, and then your gut feeling, uh, finally. And that's, you make a combination of that, and then when you feel that you've arrived at a certain conclusion, you're ready to risk doing what you have to do in order to protect it. Well, I still think uh, that 
you know, the, the reason uh, that it was startling for me to discover that you were uh, rather uh, politically conservative and a fiction writer is because most fiction writers don't have that fierce moral quality uh, in their writing. They're, they're writing uh, d typically as, you know, I would say uh, maybe run-of-the-mill utopianists who believe that in fact we're not fallen, that we're evolving uh, from something to uh, higher levels and that we can, it, I guess it was William F. Buckley who, who talked about it, but he was quoting someone else when you talked about imminentizing the eschaton, right? That if we have enough uh, taxes and we have enough government, we can fix everything and we can create utopia, you know, through social engineering or whatever it is. And we know that uh, history, especially recent modern history, is replete with examples of people trying to achieve that. So when you say something like we're fallible or, uh, you know, the, the, that uh, morality is a struggle or this or that, you, you realize that you're parting company with most of the people who create art in our time. So Yeah, well, they, they, they are afraid of a number of things. Uh, first of all, they're afraid to be ambitious. So they, 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 in, they sort of imbibe the academic tendency to particularize. The American Academy is divided between the English approach and the German approach. In the 19th century, we had to choose. Uh, Harvard chose to lean toward the, the English approach, which is which value good writing, uh, a, a graceful exposition, uh, and generalization. Uh, Johns Hopkins was the big leader, and uh, Columbia followed um, in, in valuing the German approach which was to be very particular, strict, and, and limited, uh, rigorous. See, it's a question of richness versus rigor. Uh, and writers today have inherited the, the uh, rigorous approach, which means that they limit their ambitions just the way scholars limit their ambitions. You know, um, uh, the penis denial in Belgian circus stories. Uh, as a thesis, and the, the the fiction cousins of that are you get these these novels which are like um, magazine articles. They they deliberately limit them. It's almost like John McPhee, but it's a novel. Uh, you know the uh, and and the novel might be called uh, the um, Estonian rug merchant's baboon. Or the uh, that's perfect. The, uh, that's, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah. That doesn't really exist. No. That no. sounds like a like a novel that the New Yorker would just go crazy. Of course. Yeah. And because then of it's course, got just yeah. enough exoticism, yeah. or just enough, but not too much. And right? it's kind of limited, you know. I mean, if you're talking only about a baboon that belonged to an Estonian rug right. merchant, right. Right. you're you're defining it closely but down. That, but that's as far into transcendence as like New Yorker type fiction wants to go. That's exactly right. Like the right. rug merchant yeah. alone, yeah. Th the idea of a rug merchant, he's sort of, you know, close to the world somehow, he's, he's, a, he's a rug merchant. That, but that's as far, also yeah. in the poetry that's published in the New Yorker, it's interesting because it's just part of the zeitgeist and you're, yeah. I mean, yeah. you're explicating it. But uh, They're afraid. It, They're afraid to take a chance. They're afraid to Put, them, put a marker down and say, this is what I stand for, this is what I love, uh, this is what I would die for. Uh, the, some things are good, some things are not, some things are beautiful, some things are not. They're terribly frightened. They're cowards. Uh, I mean, I, I can't generalize and say everyone, but so many, and that is the zeitgeist in, in, in modern life. I have been criticized so often these days, they say, he uses such big words, you know, and, and I don't. I mainly keep to Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Saxon vocabulary, but they say is, it, the, the sentences are too long, the descriptions are too, there's too much description. People have been trained to, to, to uh, in, inhale nihilism. There's a form, form of nihilism, like the minimalists. The, like the what? The minimalists, yeah. like Ray Carver. Like they, Carver. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they don't like... Uh, richness of language. They don't like metaphor. They don't like uh, occult meter. But they, there's a there's a reason for that, right? In other words, w when you talk about minimalists and nihilism, they are, in some ways, at war with a past, right? In other words, when, oh, yeah, when, when yeah. you think of a 
a past where all the typefaces had serifs and all the uh, buildings had moldings and whatever. They hate that because it somehow bespeaks a patriarchal uh, Christian Western order uh, that inescapably points to God. And they, they are trying to carve uh, their own minimalist path out of that. So any hint toward morality or good or evil, it, yeah. it's disturbing. And that's why I'm, you know, you, you must be a great writer just to have snuck so much of this past these uh, watchful dragons. Well, it's, it's quite easy to fool a publisher uh, at lunch. <laughs> because they drink, they drink so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and also, it, is, it, it does pay to have a business sense. Uh, you know, publishers are very slow to, to, to pick up on things, and they're not always the brightest bulbs. Um, Why don't we just say that they're they're stupid? They're stupid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the they, interest they, of time. If you, you're not going to be a lawyer, you're not going to be a doctor, you're not going to be a physicist, you're not going to be an engineer, you're not going to be a, a a businessman where you have to take risks and 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 actually see what's going to happen in the future and right. do all kinds of finance stuff. Uh, and so, what do you do? You go into publishing. That used to be. I'm your, horrified. Uh, Many publishing friends are here. Don't leave, friends. Yeah. Don't leave. Because I'll yeah. defend you in five minutes as soon as we. Yeah. Um, but but this is this is you're, you're you're being serious, right? In other words, you're saying that you uh, you you were aware of this going into writing fiction. That you're bringing something into it that you have to uh, disguise. What? Well, no, I wasn't aware in the beginning because I'm old enough so that I started when the terms were different. Uh, I started in uh, 1964. I went to Harper and Row and met a, a woman there named Joan Kahn, who was a great fiction editor, and uh, started to submit to her, and they, they, were, you know, they would get back to me. Uh, you, you were, what, 17? Yeah. Okay, I, why? What, what, <laughs> um, well, where, I'll tell you, because I, I, in, f my parents didn't read to me. That's why I said earlier that I hadn't read Charlotte's Web. I hadn't read many children's books. Charlotte's Web. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was completely, I was, I, I had a room on Central Park West that had a black linoleum floor. There were no toys in it and no books. And that's where I stayed most of the time. It sounds like, like, a, like a Skinner box. Well, it was solitary confinement. And because they were gone. My father lived in England for six months of the year. My mother was an actress. She was always on the road. And I was kept in that room, and that's where I learned to be, to, for instance, when I go to Europe, I can sit and watch a fountain for eight hours, 17 hours. I can do that. I don't mind. I like it. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I was, I, I, uh, well, yes, I, when I got to first grade, and it was at the Birch Wathen School, which in those days was on the west side, uh, I was the only kid who didn't know how to read. They all had been pushed by their parents who were all Jews in the movie business, and they wanted, the, it's like the kids now who are tutored to get into fancy kindergartens so they can go to Harvard eventually. Uh, and uh, they were pushed by their parents, and they, they came in limousines, et cetera, and I didn't know the alphabet. So I remember I walked in, Mrs. Smith was my teacher, and she said, go to the desk with your name on it. And I said, I, I can't read. And she said, okay, well, what is, your, what is your name? I told her my name. She said, find the M. And I said, what's an M? And all the kids laughed at me. Ha ha, right? So I was really pissed by you that. You made a monkey out of those kids, huh? Yeah, I, that's exactly. I was really pissed. And by second grade, I was reading beyond 12th grade level. Uh, and, and by out of sheer spite. Out of sheer spite, yeah. <laughs> and in third grade, uh, I began dictating stories to my third grade teacher who would write them in longhand. And then Simon & Schuster offered me a two-book contract in third grade <laughs> to write a biography of Abraham Lincoln <laughs> and, and a children's... Wouldn't you love to know what a third grader's biography of Abraham... I'd pay for that. Yeah. Well, well they thought it was going to be in golden books. Uh, oh. And, and a, a children's story about a mouse, which would have been essentially copped from Stuart Little. But right, right. My father said no because my mother had been a child star. And he said, look what it did to her, so I'm not going to let you do look this. Look what it did to her. Yeah. Oh, it did to her, believe me. But um, 
So, so I, uh, I, what was the question? Uh, what's capital of North Dakota? Uh, Bismarck. Okay. All right. Well, no, that, that tells yeah, it. Yeah, Pierre, well, well, South well, Dakota. Well, wait a minute. So you were, um, uh, you're leading up actually to, to a question I want to ask, but you were, you were talking about how you were raised uh, in, a, in a room with black linoleum and how you, you really were not, you, you were left to yourself yeah, effectively. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, do you now, you, you seem very cheerful. It doesn't strike me that, that you're thinking of this as neglect or something that you, or may, maybe it was neglect, but you simply aren't bitter about it. But it sounds no. like neglect, no? no? No, it wasn't neglect. What um, was it? It was neglect. <laughs> yeah, but, in the, in but, the best uh, sense of yeah, neglect. But, yeah. but my, my parents, uh, uh, I love my parents. And uh, in fact, I was crazy because uh, you know, I spent most of my life my young, while my father was alive I can see why they did this, because they probably knew what was coming. I spent most of my life tailing my father, asking him questions about his life. So I feel, and I, really I do, as if I were born in 1904, because I have spent tens of thousands of hours listening to every detail of his life. And he had a photographic memory. Uh, he was famous for it. He could, he could, someone could say to him, for example, when was the last time you were on 26th Street between uh, 3rd and 4th Avenue? And, and he would say, um, it was in, uh, this would be in the 1950s, he would say it was uh, December 17th, 1936. And they would say, describe it. And he could tell you everything that was in the store windows, the, the, uh, you know, the cracks in the side, everything. He had a complete photographic memory. So I trailed him beginning when I was very little, asking him questions about starting from the, his earliest memories. And, 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 and he lived a very adventurous, interesting life. So, so essentially, um, that's why probably they put me in the room with the linoleum, because they knew that I'd be pestering them. Right. And he needed to catch a break. And that was the only yeah. way he could get away from you. Well, um, it's interesting. This brings up uh, another quality uh, in your fiction. It does seem uh, to be of another time. You don't write, thank the Lord, like most contemporary writers. And yeah. I think it's why reading you, it's, it's like reading someone uh, fr from a different generation than, than you are. And so now at least we have some explanation of where that came from. Yeah, and in The Soldier of the Great War, which is about a 74-year-old man, strangely enough, so is Paris. He's also 74. Right. Um, I wrote A Soldier of the Great War beginning in 1980 uh, when I was, uh, let's see, a, a 33. And I've always felt like a much older person because I've sort of absorbed my father's age. Uh, and, and I also, uh, oh, I know what this, this was about originally. You, I started in a different time. And, I, and I'm a throwback to a different time and I never succumbed to the pressure to conform right. to this time, uh, simply because it's not worth it. And you, know, it, and you shouldn't ever do anything that, that you would lose sleep over or that you'd feel bad about. Well, let me ask you, you know, when you, uh, you obviously you came of age in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, you graduated Harvard in 69? 69. Okay, well, so. Well, it, uh, it graduated me. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the um, from Harvard. Yeah. The question is, uh, you know, you, you ought to be, uh, you're, you're the classic uh, boomer, you're supposed to fit into that mold, and you obviously don't. Uh, you, you, you don't strike uh, uh, people as somebody who would have been a hippie at that time or, or that kind of a person, and not only that, but then you joined uh, the Israeli, uh, is it Air Force? Army Infantry and then Air Force. I was seconded to the, seconded to the Air Force um, as an infantryman. Uh, is seconded how they say it in the West Indies? No, that's how they say it. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so my question is why did you do that? Because that seems like exactly the kind of thing uh, pot smoke and draft dodgers of your generation would, n would not do, uh, right? It's, uh, it's really yeah, very countercultural yeah. and strikingly. Well, I, I was swimming in the Harvard Sea, which, and by the way, when I was 17, uh, I was 
going through Greece, and I met a guy whose name was Alpert, who was a Harv assistant, maybe he was a graduate student then, but I think he was an assistant professor, the lowest rank of a professor. And uh, he and I uh, walked across the Peloponnesus, and we slept in barns, and we, we, we ate in, in people's houses, in goat's milk and that kind of stuff. How, how old were you? 17. Uh, and he turned out to be uh, Robert Alpert, otherwise known as Baba Ramdas, Ramdas or Ramdas as I call him. Okay, for those who don't know who that is, this is yeah. one of the uh, leading gurus of the New Age movement, yeah. practically yeah. invented New Age in America. And when he was an associate of Timothy Leary, and they, they developed LSD. So when I was a freshman, I was put in a place called Pennypacker, which was a, a, a sort of a modern building. It wasn't in the yard. And it was a, a, a sort of exiled. That was the worst possible place you could be. And Alpert lived on Harvard Street, which is where Pennypacker was, just a couple of blocks up. So I ran into him, and, I, and I, then I went to see him in his apartment. And he said, you want to smoke a joint? I didn't know what it was. I, I mean, I'm, I've never tasted coffee in my life. I don't like things like that. And uh, he, I said, no, I, well, you know, what is it? He said, oh, it's great. I said, no, I don't want it. He said, you want some LSD? And I said, what is LSD? Uh, and he said, well, it's this new thing. You put it on the sugar cube. We, we invented it, whatever, whatever. Uh, and I, ha I, ha I hated uh, the idea of, of drugs. Um, and so I, so I f from that, even, even then, even as a, as, as a freshman, I was a, a, a different. But I did swim in the political sea. I was very much against the Vietnam War. I gave a speech at West Point to the Corps of Cadets apologizing for not taking my place because although I was against the war, uh, I don't think that I was my own legislature and I should have uh, fulfilled my duties as a citizen. So that, that speech is in the congressional record. It's been printed all over the place. Um, and the reason that happened was I was sitting on the grave of William and Henry James in the Mount Auburn Cemetery. It faces south so that it's sheltered from the northern wind and also the sun shines in the south. I was writing the first story that I published in New Yorker called Leaving, well, actually the first one that was actually published was called Because of the Waters of the Flood, but the first story that I wrote that they bought was called Leaving the Church. And uh, Henry James was there, William James was there. I was uh, sitting on Henry's grave, leaning against the, the family bedstead grave marker. And a funeral in Cambridge Cemetery, which adjoins Mount Auburn, which is where Mary Baker Eddy is buried and a lot of famous people. But the Cambridge Cemetery is for the, for the proletarians. And a funeral came and they buried somebody. And then uh, they left and I went to see who was buried. And it was a boy my age who had been killed in Vietnam. And that really, really struck me. And from that point on, uh, I, I decided that I wanted to do something of that nature. I had already been 4F, but it was fake. Uh, I can, when I took an EEG, I can make electrical pulses in my body that make the needles go whap, 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 whap. You, so you can do that? I can do that. Can you teach others how to do that? Uh, <laughs> Maybe, but you don't have to worry. You're too old for the draft. Um, and uh, I can also, now my wife will have to verify this because no one will believe it. T say what I do about horses. He makes horses rear and he wants to when he looks them in the eye. And yeah. he can turn lights out under some circumstances, street lights. I don't know what he does. Yeah. But, okay, so that's <laughs> what she says. She's crazy. <laughs> but uh, so, so anyway, I, was, I had made myself 4F. And I felt very bad about that. So then I went to Israel and joined the army. We were fighting Russians, and we were fighting uh, my cousin. For Wait, why did you do that? In other words, you, you, you're, you're obviously ethnically Jewish, but you were not raised in a home that was religiously Jewish. What prompted you at that time uh, to go to Israel and fight? Uh, two words, never again. The okay. Whole, the, whole, the Holocaust. I didn't, I, in 1967, which is when I went first, uh, they, uh, the state was threatened with uh, annihilation. And I just didn't want that to happen, so I wanted to do my, my piece. And I, and I did. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I tried to join the Marines too, but I had already been 4F. They wouldn't let me do it. Uh, um, 
Gosh. Uh, I want to ask you about, um, do, do you think there's something inherent uh, in, in Jewishness? Uh, that, and, and that's, gosh, it's so s sloppy even to talk that way. But I guess the moral quality of your fiction, uh, even before I knew that you'd fought in the Israeli army, uh, struck me as coming out of being a Jew. Because being a Jew obviously comes with certain experiences. Um, and you often have characters who are, I guess they, they remind me, I was, I, I'm always sure that, I'm, that they're autobiographical. Um, and it, it, it's, they're very romantic. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of love. It's beautiful love. It's not uh, sexual. Uh, that itself is rare. But it, it, it struck me that um, somehow it, it, it feels to me like something that I've noticed uh, in, in other Jewish stories, usually movies. Woody Allen, in some of his best films, has this. It's interesting. He doesn't come out where, where you do. But it's interesting to me uh, that you're very much of a romantic. Um, what, ha, has that been something that you've thought much about, uh, is who you are as a Jew? I mean, you just said never again. So this was something that meant a lot to you. Yeah, I mean, um, I, my father's family came from a little village near Minsk called Koydniev. And when we lived in upstate New York, we had a farm in Kinderhook, New York, a huge farm. And uh, it was 32, on September 1st, when we took the kids to school for the first time, there was snow on the ground, September 1st. And that, that winter, it was 32 below. The pool fence was covered by the early October, and it, we didn't see it again until, until May. I mean, it was a hell of a winter. But anyway, at the edge of our farm, far away, was a auto repair shop. And in the auto repair shop, uh, which was really miserable, freezing cold and dirty with oil, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they had people working on cars, but it was a sort of like a very primitive type thing. And I went down there once to talk about our car, uh, and I was wearing uh, boots and uh, gray pants and a gray 6040, and I had a gray Stetson, and I had my uh, pistol on, and I had a giant dog who was a Bernice Mountain Dog named Constance. And I walked into this place, and one of the mechanics reared back. He almost threw himself against the wall because he was terrified because he thought I was a state cop, and he was frightened of cops. Why? He was a Russian, and he didn't have teeth. Uh, and his name, his name was Igor, uh, and it turns out he was a Jew from the area. And I said to him, um, my family came from Koydniev. Uh, do you know it? He said, oh, he said, it's just a stone. He said, I said, the stone? And he meant, you know, like a gravestone. And it turns out that the Einsatzgruppen, the, the special group, the Germans, uh, they would get trucks, put people in the trucks, and then put the exhaust back into the trucks, drive to a, a pit where they would just throw all the dead people. And they killed every single person in the village. And these were all my relatives. Uh, we were lucky. We, uh, my family escaped. We came here in 1870. Um, and uh, that doesn't uh, leave you. you know, in, in the Second World War, uh, we had 32 people who served, uh, one of whom, my cousin Robert, uh, died in his uh, fighter plane. Uh, and my father volunteered at age. He went into this, the uh, OSS stuff when he was 36. He was past uh, draft age. And so I felt the same way. And I feel the same way about America, too. I mean, if, if, if America were threatened now, uh, I would volunteer. Oh, 71, they're not going to take me. But uh, I, I do serve, actually, now in an armed capacity. Uh, I'll be retiring in two years. <laughs> um, w time flies when you're having fun. So we, we don't have a lot of uh, time left. I wanted to ask you to tell the story of uh, meeting, hanging out with John Cheever as a kid. You, you have such a storied life that it makes your fiction seem almost dull. Uh, and your fiction is not even close to dull. But, it, but you really do have, and you're aware of that, having an outrageously storied life and, yeah, and of having yeah. met the kind of people when you were already a kid that most people don't get to meet in their lifetime. Winston Churchill. You met Churchill? Yeah, when I was very little at Lake Annecy 
in, uh, I think it was 1951 or whatever, um, my father, who had worked for him in the war, uh, was, we were in, in Annecy too, and my father was taking something to him from Alexander Corda, who was my father's business partner. And I, I rode on my father's leg, and we waited in an ante room with a stone floor with a lot of other men, most of whom were British, in suits. And then the doors opened and Winston Churchill came out. Uh, and I was still riding in my father's, you know, standing on his shoes and holding onto his leg. But uh, you want to, about Cheever? I can tell you about Cheever. Uh, yeah, quickly, because I want to ask you about Winter's Tale. This is okay. ridiculous. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I, uh, actually, it turns out that Theodore Roosevelt invented this thing called straight lining. At Sagamore Hill, he would have his kids go in a straight line no matter what, you know, climb over a wall, crawl through a swamp or whatever. I didn't know this, but I invented it for myself when I lived in Eagle Bay, which is in Austin, we had about 1,000, 2,000 acres uh, of more or less forest. And I had the idea just independently that I would go in a straight line. So one day... You know you're nuts, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was walking to school. I used to walk five miles to school and five miles back. Um, and, and later, I had actually... Isn't that weird? Yeah. That it was five miles there and, <laughs> and five miles back. And the funny thing what was... What are the odds of that? Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Sometimes uh -huh. it wasn't. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. all right. Because I would take a different route. Okay. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> what I meant was that I would not only walk to school, but also back. Right. And uh, one day I, I was running a little late, and John Cheever came by in his uh, Nash Rambler, the color of Pepto-Bismol. And he opened the door and said, Marco, because my name was Marco then. He said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm walking to school. He said, well, you'll be late. And I said, would you like a ride? So I said, OK. So I got in the car, and we rode to school. Because he had lived in the garage above the, uh, above the garage uh, in, in the, in, on the school grounds with his family. Um, now, did you know at the time that he was a famous writer? Yeah, we all knew. Um, his kids went to the same school, and um, people, people knew he was deathly poor at the time. Uh, and my parents knew, they were friends with him. So, so I, I got in the car and he said, well, why do you walk? And I was telling him, and I told him about straight lining. The next thing I know, there was this, movie, this story called The Swimmer about Burt Lancaster who did a straight line. But that's okay, I mean, people borrow. Uh, <laughs> and, and so uh, in all seriousness, your conversation with Cheever influenced him to write the swimmer. Yes, uh, for sure. And so hold, then hold hold it right there. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, uh, that's I bet one that, of the greatest short yeah. stories of the 20th century. Yeah. And the fact that you may have had something to do with it, apart from writing, is is really something. I bet if Susie and Benji uh, knew about this, they would probably attack me and say, "Oh, it's not true," but it is true. Well, um, in the story, and I remember Cheever better than I remember your fiction. Uh, he talks about taking a dog leg at some point. Oh, I never read the story. So, so you're, you're a liar. I've never... I've, uh, no, no, but it, it's... No. Um, I've never read any There's of another it. story about when they he wrote talks... A, he wrote a book about my family called Bullet Park. We lived in Brayton Park. And when Martin Luther King was killed, there were riots in Ossining, and they were burning down the, the, uh, the stores and stuff and people, attacking people's houses. So my father and I went, and we bought ammunition. And then uh, Mary and John Cheever... And uh, Howard, um, what, the guy who, who played the Benjamin Franklin in 1776, Howard De Silva, uh, came to brunch. And they said, you know, th th this was the time when the, the, this, these riots going on. And we said, yeah, we, we bought ammunition. And, and, the, and the Cheever said, you what? And we said, we bought ammunition. He said, why? In case people come to try to burn our house down. And they said, you would shoot people who were going to kill you? you know? And the answer was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, at that, and Howard De Silva, who was an old communist. My mother was a communist in the 30s, too. So she knew a lot of communists. That's why he was there. Uh, he, he, he was just horrified that we would defend ourselves. So, so, were, the, so were the Cheevers. But I, I got to get the, to the red meat, OK? Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and that is that... Uh, when I published my, my first book, which is called The Dove of the East, it was published by Knopf, and I had a lot of stories from the New Yorker in it. I was uh, quite young, and I came home from New York after having an editorial conference with Rachel McKenzie, who was a New Yorker, one great New Yorker editor. 
and I was on the train. I was reading uh, Carlos Baker's uh, biography of Hemingway. I thought that would be my life. You know, that, that see, I, it wasn't the old days. I thought things were going to be different. And I got home and I took off my my suit. I think it was this one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I saw John Cheever out by the pool because he they didn't have a pool. And they, yeah, this had to be 1978. No, it was 1975. Uh, 74. It was 1974. Uh, and he, he was sitting by the pool. So I figured, well, hey, I have the same publisher. He knows I published in The New Yorker. If he reviews it, on the, it'll go on the front page of the New York Times book review, my first book. So I, so I went down to him and I said, uh, I said, hi, John. And I, I mixed this up with when I went down, and he, he had written... The Faulkner. Faulkner, yeah. uh, which he pronounced as Faulkner. I, I called it Falconer, being right. you know, a, a, pro, a pro. And, and, and he said, hi, Mark. And I said, hi. Uh, and, he, and he said, right off the bat, he said, you know, uh, Faulkner um, was uh, so-and-so and so-and-so. You know, saying something good, won the National Book Award. National Book National Award. Book no, Award. you told him yeah. that Faulkner. No, 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 no. I remember. Uh, he said something about it, and then I said, "Big deal. Faulkner won the Nobel Prize." Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because I thought he was saying Faulkner. He's See, saying now, now Falconer. Gotta, we have to slow this down because people may be missing. This is very funny. Yeah. John Cheever. <laughs> Uh, who spoke with this plummy uh, North Shore, uh, South Shore, uh, uh, sorry, South Shore, Boston accent, pronounced his book, Falconer, Falconer as Faulkner. 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 So when he said that, when he said Faulkner you thought won he was talking about, about William, William Faulkner. Faulkner. And he said <laughs> Faulkner was, you know, made the, the uh, Faulkner something won the special, something prize. Something special, and you said, yeah. big deal, said, Faulkner big deal. won it, the Nobel Faulkner Prize. Faulkner won the Nobel Prize. And he went like this, you know, <laughs> for a second, you know. It was summer, it was before, it was June, it was before Nobel Prize season. But he still went like that, so thinking, oh, it did, you know. And that was later in the 70s. Yeah, that because was, I guess I Faulkner came out at, right. Yeah, okay, I so confused them. But... But and people, uh, Clay, uh, Clay, Craig Claiborne, uh, said to me once at dinner at his house. He said, "Mark, he spoke like this. He said, Do you, the, uh, our, our, is John Chivo gay?'" And I said, "Oh no, 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 no." Um, he said, "Because he understand about homosexual love." <laughs> and I said, "Well, I, I, he, I've known him since I was a child. He's not gay. See, it shows what I knew." Uh, I, I didn't even know what gay was until I was in after college. But so anyway, I go down to the, to the in a different time and I say, you know, I have a book out. Could you review it um, for the Times? Thinking, you know, this is going to be it. And he said, well, Mark, he said, actually, Saul and I are coming out with books this fall and uh, we've pledged not to review any other books. And I felt at that moment both, A, really angry that he wasn't going to do this for me. And I had known him all my life, and I had gave, I'd given him the idea for the swimmer, which was his big thing. <laughs> and also ashamed that I wanted to be in that system of back scratching that I was angry about. And I decided right then, at that moment, I would never write a blurb for anybody. I would never ask anybody for a blurb. I would never serve on a prize jury. I would never go to Yado or anything like that. I would never have anything to do with any writers whatsoever. That is for fiction. I do sometimes review nonfiction books, but for fiction, which is what I do. And I've kept that promise. You'll never see a blurb from me. Out of, sheer, out of sheer spite. Out of, no, out of shame. Uh, for, for wanting to be in that unfair system right. where you know right. somebody or whatever. And by the way, I was riding in the elevator at Knopf when Toni Morrison got in the elevator with the director of publicity. And this is what, before Song of Solomon came out. And I had Refiner's Fire coming out in the same list. And the director of publicity didn't know me from anything, you know, nothing. She, she didn't recognize me. And she said to to Tony Morrison, who was an editor at Random House at the time, she said, I want you to know, shh, shh, I want you to know 
that we just had the editorial meeting and Bob, meaning Bob Gottlieb, um, has decided that we're going to concentrate everything on your book. Your book is going to be, so I'm sitting there, my book is going to be in the same list. And uh, I said, okay, all right, that's, that's, that's life. Yeah. And once we had uh, dinner at a Japanese restaurant in Nyack, and we were sitting next to, to near Tony Morrison, and uh, she didn't recognize me just like us in the elevator, but I knew who she was, and she was just bitching, bitching, bitching. She has about 300 honorary degrees, Nobel Prize, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I was saying, she doesn't have much to complain about. <laughs> Well, I always know I didn't like Bob Gottlieb, so thank you for yeah. giving me evidence. I didn't like Bob Gottlieb either. I, I wanted to, uh, to end on a sour note, and I think uh, <laughs> we've achieved that. Mark, uh, uh, e e really, it's so much fun to talk to you. I knew that it would be an outrage to have to limit it to an hour, so we're going to find a way to haul you back uh, up here. Maybe next time you won't have to drive. Um, but we... Uh, there, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, and uh, maybe we can do it another time, but it has been a magnificent joy and honor for me uh, to do this. So, Socrates in the City crowd, maybe uh, once again, you can thank our special guest, Mark Helprin. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.